Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God wants to see change, growth, maturity in our life. And one of the best ways to see those things coming about is worship. And in fact, when we talk about worship, there is growth and maturity and change. And what I mean by that is simply, not all worship is the same. As you worship God and you do so correctly, what's correctly? Well, the scripture says in the New Covenant, in the book of John in chapter 4, those who worship God, it is necessary to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, we're going to see that there is an emphasis in this passage that we're going to be looking at from the book of Genesis and Revelation. There is revelation, meaning the word of God, truth. There's also the Holy Spirit. So it's only when we worship God being led by the Holy Spirit, but the foundation is the word of God, scripture, his revelation, his truth. Those two things go together. And when we ignore one, neglect one, or emphasize one over the other, our worship is going to be not pleasing to God. But when we worship him properly in spirit and truth, there is going to be change and transformation, and we will grow and mature. Let me say it this way, that proper worship is a catalyst to transformation, to change, to maturing and growing us closer and more pleasing to God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis chapter 35. Now, we have seen for the last couple weeks that Yaakov, he is traveling back and has arrived into the promised land what is frequently called in the book of Genesis, the land of Canaan. We also know it as the land of Israel. And even in these terminology, we see growth or change. That it once was the land of Canaan, but now it's going to be spoken of more and more as the land of Israel. And let me share with you that this 35th chapter, especially what we're going to be studying today, has significant implications for the last days. In other words, when we understand God's message to us here in Genesis 35, it helps us understand with a proper expectation what God's going to bring about the changes and the transformations that he's going to bring about among his people in the last days as they themselves, I'm talking about the children of Israel, the Jewish people, returning back from exile to the land. Let's begin. Genesis 35, verse 1. And God spoke to Yaakov. And notice he says two things very similar. The word kum and the word ale. Kum means to get up. It's usually referring to one who's sitting or laying down. He stands up. And the word ale means to go up. So we could look at it in a physical sense that Yaakov was sitting down. God says, get up and go up, rise up to Bet El. Now, you'll recall that Bet El was mentioned emphasize back in Genesis 28 when Yaakov was leaving the land on the way to his mother's family in order to flee from Asaph. This is going to be taught emphatically in a moment and as a byproduct to take a wife for himself. But the emphasis 
as we're going to see here, is fleeing from Asaph. That'll be emphasized in a moment. Let's look again at verse 1. And God said to Yaakov, rise up or get up and go up Bet El. Now, what's significant is the word to is not in the scripture. And this speaks about a message, a message of rising up Bet El, going up, rising up to the presence of God. Not done in a normal way, but a spiritual way. Rise up, Bet-El, not go to Bet-El or rise up to Bet-El. It's speaking about something that is is supernatural. Something that is lacking the physical because the spiritual takes care of it. So there's an emphasis here upon a spiritual dimension. Look again. Get up, go up, Bet El, and dwell there. So this is going to be where initially Yaakov dwells. And he's instructed, second part of verse 1, and make there an altar to the Lord. Literally, La El, to God. So it doesn't say to the Lord, but to God, who appeared unto you when you fled from before Asaph, your brother. Now, this is the first time, I've mentioned it earlier, but this is the first time that we're reminded that when he left the land of Israel, he was doing so out of persecution. And the same thing can be said among the Jewish people throughout history, that God brought about oftentimes because of his displeasure with the people, he brought about persecution and they were driven from the land. This was certainly true, not because of Yaakov's doing something incorrect, but we see that there is going to be a suffering for faithfulness that is going to come about in the last days, that is going to Bring the people back to the land. And what is that suffering for faithfulness? Being recognized as the people of God. Being recognized as a covenant member. What we're going to see in the last days is that the world is going to hate the covenant that God has made and extended all of his covenants. His covenant with Abraham, his covenant with Moses, his covenant of the land, all of these things, because they're all connected to the promises of God and ultimately the kingdom of God, they're going to come under attack. So we see an emphasis. Here's the first indication that Yaakov fled because of persecution, fleeing from his brother who wanted to kill him. Look again at the text. Look now to verse 2. And Yaakov spoke to his house. Now, his house is his family members. We're speaking about his wives and his children. But there's also, if we keep reading, and to all who were with him. Now, the emphasis of this passage is going to be upon those who were with him. Who are those? His house, it's very easy to understand. But those who were with him, those are individuals that for whatever reason, they joined with Yaakov and were coming back to the land with him. Now, when I say coming back, this was not them coming back. He was returning and he was bringing people with him. And here again, this is something when we look at this text, that is prophetic. It speaks about a last day occurrence. We know, for example, that there are going to be many people, and we're speaking about those of the nations, the Gentiles, that are going to grab onto the titsit, the corner of a Jewish male's garment, where it has those fringes that represents the commandments of God. And they're going to say, we want to go with you. We want to go up to the Lord God, 
to worship him. So in the last days, when the Jewish people return, there is going to be a multitude of Gentiles with them. And this is a paradigm of that. It is a a foretelling of that. So look again, verse 2. And Yaakov said to his house and to all who were with him, and notice there's going to be, as the people return back to the land, a spiritual change. Obedience always brings in a spiritual maturity, that factor, that element. And what does he say? He says, remove the foreign gods which is in your midst. So these individuals who have joined with the family of Yaakov, they were idol worshipers. Now, perhaps we know that that Rachel, she took some of her, her father's, I'm speaking about Lavan, some of his idols. So even perhaps these other individuals, perhaps there was a, a hint of idolatry among his family. In the last days, that'll certainly be true among the Jewish people. And therefore, as they return back to the land, God is going to bring about purity. He is going to bring about spiritual transformation. So we see a foretaste of that. Remove the foreign gods which are in your midst and purify yourselves and change your garments. Now, this is important because we see a foundation. When the children of Israel came under the leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu, that is Moses, our teacher, when they came to Mount Sinai, remember what's written in Exodus 19, and that is Moses told the people, prepare yourself, sanctify yourself, because in three days there's going to be revelation at Mount Sinai. And he says, wash your garments. So this changing of garments, also remember the garments prophetically throughout the scripture speaks about deeds. So there's a change of behavior. This is what this passage says, that God is going to bring about a change in how the people act, live, behave. They're going to be transformed. So purify yourselves and change your garments verse 3 and let us rise up same word different form but same root here it's nakuma let us rise up or get up vi nale and let us go up bet el again leaving out that preposition and the reason for this is once again because of the spiritual dimension we're rising up And we would expect two, but it just simply is said the place. Let us rise up, bet El. And the point is that this is not happening in a physical manner alone, but a spiritual matter. And let us make there, and I will make there, excuse me, I will make there an altar to the God who answered me and the day of my trouble. Now, this is another important text because it says God will answer. He's done so in the past. And in Yaakov's life, we look here, it says the one who answers me in the day of my trouble. It's in the present. Now, it's a participle, but it represents a present, and some would say an ongoing reality. That God is the one who answers in the day of trouble. And the word for trouble is that same word that's oftentimes the New Testament counterpart, part thalipsis, speaking of tribulation. It's also the word that appears in the Hebrew language, in the book of Daniel and the book of Jeremiah, that speaks about trouble or tribulation as a time of Jacob's trouble or Jacob's tribulation. So the choice of words, what appears here, also is very prophetic and relates to the same language in the last days. Look again. He says in the middle of verse 3, and I will make there an altar to the God, the one who answers me 
in the day of my trouble. And it came about that he was with me on the way when I went. Now here, I think some Bibles will say traveled, but it's the way word halakti, walking. Now he was traveling, but it's the word walk, which is significant and not the word nasati. And why the difference? Because the word halakti represents lifestyle. It is the same word for Jewish law. So when we look at this, it's speaking about God's presence when we walk or live with him when we go upon his way. Verse 4. And the individuals who were with him, it says, and they gave to Yaakov all their foreign gods in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And what did he do? Now, your Bibles may say he buried it or he, he set it, but it's a word, a unique word. It's a word here, vayitmon. Vayitmon, it means to conceal it, hide it, put it away. And the implication is, so it's just not buried, but it is, is concealed with the implication of not being discovered. And notice what he did. He, he concealed it or concealed them, these false gods and these earrings that, that represent obedience or submissiveness to these foreign gods. So it says, and Yaakov concealed them underneath the tree. And this is probably an oak tree. Other Bibles use a different word, but it's the word for a modern oak tree today, which is in Shechem. Now, Shechem is also a historical place. So he puts it there in this location, and notice verse 5. And they traveled, and it came about that there was a godly dread, meaning a fear, but this is not the word Yerat Hashemayim, a fear of God, fear of the heavens, literally, but it implies a fear of God. But this is a word for for dread or despair, and then we have the word Elohim after it. So God caused, he's the source of this, this dread that came upon the people. What people? Keep reading. And as they traveled, meaning they were drawing closer to Bethel, it came about a godly dread that were upon the cities which were in their area, meaning in that area where they were traveling. And these individuals of those cities did not pursue after the children of Yaakov, meaning his family and those who were with him. So here's the message. As the people were returning back to the land, God supernaturally, and that's what it means here when we look at this phrase, chitat Elohim, a godly dread or fear. It is something supernatural. So as Yaakov and his family and those who were with him were returning back to where God wanted them to be, even though that in the natural, those residents of the cities wanted to stop that, to persecute them, to hinder them from that. God moved in a supernatural way, and he did not allow these individuals to hinder. And what this foreshadows is in the last days. God is going to supernaturally protect those who are returning back to the land. Look now to verse, verse 6. And Yaakov came to Luza. Now, what's important here, we find the phrase Luz. I said Luza. Now, Luza speaks about the last letter is a He. And when that He appears at the end of a word, it means to or towards. So we have a significant change. As he was approaching Luz, we have a different construction. Remember what we talked about twice mentioned. It says, Kum Ale Bet El, or in the plural, 
we find the Nakuma Naale Bet El without any reference to two or towards. But here, when it's spoken about Luz, which is in the past, why do I say past? This, as we'll see in a moment, is its former name. When it gets a new name, a new name signifies transformation. And that's very important that we understand that because that's going to be relevant in regard to Yaakov as an individual. That he is going through transformation. So look at this passage. What stands out is Yaakov came in a natural manner. Meaning, although he's traveling, the emphasis here is on the natural, that he came physically to lose. And it says, which is in the land of Canaan, also a, a lesser term for the promised land. It says, it is Bet El. And it says, who, that is he, Yaakov, and all the people which were with him. So they arrived at this location physically. And that physical obedience is going to have a spiritual outcome. Why do I say that? Well, look now, if you would, to verse 7. Notice that they begin to work physically, but for a spiritual purpose. It says here, verse 7, And he built there an altar, and he called the place El Bet El, which means God, house of God. And this is very significant because we see the word El, God, twice. And we see a double portion. Now, this double portion, oftentimes a double portion, if you ask the rabbinical scholars, they will say one portion for this age, another portion for the age to come. So this is a hermeneutical clue. If we missed it the first time, it is to tell us that this has last day's kingdom implications to it. So once more, he called that place El Bet El, which means God, the house of God, for there revealed to him the God. Now this is important because there appears the definite article, the God. So the God, not one of many, but the one and only God, appeared to him there. When, and this is the second time it's mentioned, when he fled from before his brother. Now, this time, you see the change? If you go back, look if you would to verse 1. We read at the verse 1, very similar language. Be varchacha mi pane esav. Achicha. So when you fled from before Asaph, your brother. But when we look the second time, Asaph, that name does not appear there. And that's significant. Whenever a name is removed, it is to show God's displeasure. And he is displeased with Asaph. Look now at verse 8. In verse 8, we have an interesting occurrence. We read, And Devorah, the nurse of Rivka. Now, this would have been the woman who assisted nursing Rivka, that is Rebecca, and participating in a major way in, in Rebecca's or Rivka's growth, her being raised up. So it would have been like her nanny who was with her for, for all of her days in that house as a small child and then a teenager and a young woman. Traditionally, we find that Rivka, she left this family at a very early age. So she departed from Devor in order to travel back with Eliezer in order to marry Yitzchak. So many, many years that Devor and Rivka have been separated. But now this older lady, she is making her last journey. She presumably would not have been a an family member. 
she would have been a Gentile, but yet she's coming back. And notice what it says. And Devorah, the nurse of Rivka, she died and was buried underneath Bet El, that is the house of God. And this is a statement of blessing. To be buried there underneath Bet El, the house of God, is to show a reward that she, for her faithfulness in raising up Rivka and now responding, wanting to want travel. She's obviously old because she died. The last thing she did, she was pursuing to go up with Yaakov, with the children of Jacob, to the land of Israel. And she made it there, and she died in arriving at Beth El. So look again, verse 8. And Devorah, the nurse of Rivka, died, and she was buried below or underneath the Beth El, the house of God, underneath the alone. Alone is tree. And he called its name alone Bachut. Now, some say Bachut. Others will say Bachot. Now, that word, bachut, has to do with weeping or crying. And it's simply to speak of the fact that there was great sadness when this woman died. Now, the rabbinical commentators point out that the word bachut can be written bachot, and that would be in the plural, because it signifies, and this is something midrashic, meaning it is a tradition based upon no scriptural basis other than the fact that if we translate the word bachut, bichot, meaning in the plural, that it's weepings, and some say Rivka also died. Well, that is not at all found in the scripture, so although the rabbinical world teaches that as, as fact, the Bible does not, so I wanted to mention it, but we do not believe in that. So they call the name of that place Alon Bachut, the place of weeping. Verse, verse 9. And God appeared to Yaakov again when he came from Pardam Aram and he blessed him. Now, blessing is oftentimes revelation. One of the greatest blessings you can have is God revealing something. And in this text, we're going to see that there is revelation to Yaakov that has meaning for us. We are privileged to find out what that revelation is. Look again, verse 9. And God appeared to Yaakov again when he came from Padan Aram. He blessed him. And he said, verse 10, and he, God said to him, your name, now we already know this, but it's being repeated. And its repetition, repet, repetition is for emphasis. And notice a change in name, transformation. This is all about getting, returning out of exile back to the land for the purpose of arriving at Bet El. What's Bet El? A place of worship. Why do we know that? Build an altar there. And the point is, look how Devor died, death, the death of the flesh, but we're going to be made alive in the spirit. So all of these things are in the text, but notice what he says. And God said to him, your name, Yaakov, will no longer be called Yaakov. Rather, which is key M, rather, Yisrael will be your name. And he called his name Yisrael. Now, I think it's so significant, that last phrase. And he called his name, meaning God did so. God called him Yisrael. Why would we want to refer to Israel? Not just the person, but the land as well. And where we're going in this passage, and it's not by coincidence, we're going to emphasize the land of Israel. 
And why would we, when God spoke that word Israel, why would we want to call it by anything else? And the purpose is for a replacement, for a substitute, for an alternative. And when we buy into an alternative, a substitute, we're really buying into a counterfeit. And what should come into our mind is Hasatan, Satan. Because Satan is the king of counterfeit. So don't use other words like Palestine for the term Israel. It is an offense of God. We want to speak the same way that God did. We want to use the same terms that he did. So look at it again. And he called his name, what? Israel. Verse 11. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai, the God who is sufficient enough. Now, most English translations speak about the mighty God, and he's that. But here it simply means the God which is always enough, sufficient, meaning he's always suitable, appropriate for whatever circumstance, position, problem, need that you have. So God spoke to him, I am El Shaddai, and notice what he says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, when we think of that, we think of what was said in the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden has kingdom implications. When we look at that final state of the kingdom, I'm speaking about the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, we find great similarities, great uh, uh, likeness between what was said about the Garden of Eden and what is said about the New Jerusalem. So this is a kingdom implication. When it says be fruitful and multiply, it means live a kingdom life. Be fruitful and multiply, and what's going to happen? A goy, which is a nation, and a kingdom of nations will be from you. So the promise is this. In the same way that Adam ve Chava were told to be fruitful, multiply, and build up a world. Now, Yaakov is being told to do that in order that a kingdom people might be, be, be brought into this world. And notice it says Goy, which is a people or nation. It is similar to, not similar, but, but the exact word. When God in the Abrahamic covenant back in Genesis 12 says, I'm going to make you a great nation, he says, Goy Gadol. It is prophetic when this word appears. A congregation of Goyim. So a congregation of peoples, not just of one ethnic group or race or color, but of a multiplicity. And it says, they will come from you. And what else? U Malachim. Kings from your loins will come forth. Now, one of the ways that this can be understood is this. Also, looking at the book of Revelation, we are told as believers, as kingdom people, that we are going to rule and reign with Messiah. So ultimately, the people of God, and this is what we're referring to here, ultimately, the people of God are going to rule with God. We are going to become a kingdom a priest of servants and a holy nation and this is hinted to at the end of verse 11 look now to verse 12 in verse 12 we're talking about this this promise these covenantal promise and the kingdom and what should come into our mind what is foundational in those promises that covenant the kingdom well there's an emphasis upon the land and that's why individuals that, that ignore the significance of the land of Israel. There's one uh, uh, Christian leader based in Minneapolis, and he'll make brash statements that are so unscriptural. He'll say, you know, God's not interested in real estate. Yes, he is. In this real estate, he truly is. What does the scripture say? It says the meek shall inherit the earth. And foundationally, Israel, is ground zero for that earth, which is a kingdom earth that's being referred to here. Because the word inherit, 
Yerusha or Lereshet. It is tied to the word Jerusalem. Many people don't know that, but the word inherit is related to Jerusalem. So we read, look again, verse 12, and the land. And the way that this scripture, this verse is written, because it begins with v'et ha'aretz. Now, different English translations jumble up the words in different order. But we ought not. Because what's said here, v'et ha'aretz, and the land which I am giving or I have given to Avraham, to Itzchak, and to you. So he says, what's emphatic, the land which I have given to Avraham and Yitzchak and to you, the patriarch's promise. There's a connection between the land and promise. He says, I am giving it and to your seed after you. I give the land. Now what's important is this verse begins with the et ha'arts and it ends at ha'arts, the land. So we need to see that in all of this scripture, when we're looking at this first half of Genesis 35, he's speaking about a transformation, a change, spiritual maturity. We're going to the house of God to worship. We see that there is an end of the enemies. Asaph, he's mentioned the first time, but not the second. This godly fear, meaning the fear of, of the people of God, God caused a godly dread, a dread from him to call to fall upon the enemies so that the people could come back to the land and get to the place for worship. We saw the death of the flesh. We saw a transformation in the name, meaning a new man, a transformation. And then we see all of that about being fruitful, multiply, doing kingdom work, a reminder that there's going to be a multiplicity of language, tongues, people, nations being part of this, remember, and those who are with him, with Jacob. And then we see, foundationally, this emphasis upon the land. Verse 11, And the land which I have given to Avraham, to Yitzchak, and to you, I am giving it, and to your seed after you, I am giving the land. Now, when we look here, we find three times, three times, the word give, I am giving it to, to you, is mentioned. And this is because it shows that God gave it to the Jewish people. Verse 13. And God went up from him in that place where he had spoken to him. God departed. And notice what Yaakov did, verse 14. And Yaakov caused to stand a, a monument in the place which he had spoken, that is, God had spoken to him, a monument of stone. Now, why is that important, that word stone? Because the word Evan is oftentimes related to Messiah. The rabbinical commentators remember that likewise, when we go back to Genesis 28, the first time he was there, we find that same word in the text, this uh, matseva, this, this monument, matsevet aven, is mentioned here, and it referred to the Messiah. Vayisech aleha, and he poured upon it a libation. Vayitzoch, and he anointed it with oil. So this anointing, this libation is a form of worship, and then this anointing refers to Messiah. So it speaks of a worship of Messiah that the Jewish people will do in the last days. Verse 15, and Yaakov called the name of that place which God had spoken to him there. So three times we see an emphasis on God's revelation. All of this came about because of the word of God. Verse 15, And Yaakov called the name of the place which God had spoken to him there. It says, Elohim Bet El. God had spoken to him there, and he called the name of that place Bet El, the house of God. So once more, this passage of scripture, house of God, intimacy. It is prophetic because 
That's where we're going to be. We are going to be drawn and brought into the intimacy of God that brings about a transformation, a change. And when we're worshiping God, one of the things we haven't spoken of, but when we worship God in the scripture, there are several references to the promises of God. Realize there's a relationship between worshiping God, being drawn into his presence, worshiping him, and becoming the recipients of the promises of God. Important information for those who want to serve and worship him in spirit and truth. Well, we'll close with that until next week. May God bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.